So let's uh, go ahead and get started. So last time uh, we left off with uh, we're discussing uh, magnetism, specifically the magnetic field that's produced by a wire that has current flowing through it. So to remind you, if we had some uh, if we had some wire and it had some current I flowing through it, we could find what the magnetic field was uh, that's produced by this wire by saying that this magnetic field is going to be equal to um, mu naught times I divided by 2 pi R, where mu naught is the permeability of free space, I is the current uh, measured in amperes, uh, 2 pi is just some constant, and then uh, R is the distance from the wire to the point where we're finding the magnetic field. And so we remember this was also some uh, vector, uh, and we could find the direction of the magnetic field by saying that we could apply what, what I call the second version of the right-hand rule. And that's to say that we take our thumb and we point it in the direction of the current, and then uh, we can find the direction of the magnetic field by uh, curling our fingers around in, in the direction that uh, our fingers are naturally going to curl with our right hand. So that tells us for this um, current here, uh, above here I have the magnetic field pointing out, and then uh, below I have the magnetic field pointing in, remembering that we had this notation for in and out. So this um, circle with the dot is uh, representing an arrow that is coming towards you. So you have the arrow coming towards you, you see the tip of the arrow, so that's why we have the circle with the dot. And then uh, going in is uh, the circle with the cross uh, in it. That's uh, representing uh, the arrow moving away from us. Okay. So that was uh, what we did last time. Um, now to build on this, we also want to talk about how changing magnetic fields can induce currents. And this is what's called uh, Lenz's Law or uh, Faraday's Law. And so, so the statement of uh, Lenz's law is that uh, this is Lenz's law. Nature abhors changes in magnetic flux and acts to oppose change. Okay. So there's quite a few things that we need to unpack here. Um, the first is defining what's called flux. And so flux uh, for some generic uh, vector says that um, the flux that we, we call this uh, some capital phi, uh, and we'll talk specifically about magnetic flux here. Uh, the magnetic flux is defined to be the magnitude of some magnetic field times the area that it flows through times the cosine of the angle between the, uh, the orientation of the area and the field itself. And so we can think about this pictorially by looking at this is some area, uh, and then I have some magnetic field that's going to go through the area. So B is going to point in this direction, and uh, this is the, uh, the area vector points perpendicular to the surface. And so we can see, in this case, the area vector and the, uh, the magnetic field are going to be in the same direction. And so the cosine of the angle between these is going to be maximized. It says that the cosine of the angle is going to be, um, uh, going to be equal to 1. Now, we could, we could think about a case where the cosine of the angle is minimized. And that's uh, a case like this, where we have some magnetic field going this way, and the loop oriented like this, right? So this is the area vector now. And we can see that the magnetic fields and the area vector are going to be perpendicular to each other. And so that minimizes the flux. And the way you can think about flux is it's like um, the flow of water through a pipe. And so this orientation, if, if the, the magnetic field represents the water and the area represents the pipe, this one has the most water flowing through the pipe. Whereas this one, uh, and we could kind of extend this out so we could say, okay, Okay, uh, this is this is kind of representing the pipe, so it's flowing through the pipe. Whereas this one, I don't have any water flowing through the pipe because the the water is flowing perpendicular to the pipe. Okay. 
So that's the first part of uh, London's law. And so this says that nature pours uh, changes magnetic flux. Uh, so this gives us some notion of what is meant by magnetic flux. And I'll, we'll unpack this a little bit more uh, as we're going through the questions for today and how it's going to oppose the change in flux. But for now, um, I think uh, this suffices. Now, additionally, what we can say um, is that uh, Faraday's law really says that um, the induced EMF, EMF uh, is going to be uh, going to be equal to some change in the magnetic flux divided by some change in time if we treat these all as, as magnitudes. Okay. Uh, well, again, we'll unpack this a little bit more when we get to the calculations, but I wanted to kind of lay this out uh, uh, for the time being. Okay. So, any any questions about this? We're really going to be starting at uh, this point right here, and then we're going to move into uh, discussions of Lenz's law and uh, Faraday's law, doing uh, conceptual questions first. Okay, it's all good so far? Okay, so what I want to do to start with is to go back to this calculation that we did last time. Uh, and this is uh, really just to kind of reinforce the things that we talked about last time and uh, this equation in particular. And so what we're going to be doing here we have these two current carrying wires. We want to calculate what the magnetic field is at uh, each one of these three points. And we can do this algebraically. So consider the distance from one of the wires to the points to be some distance d. And then call this uh, call the, uh, the currents I1 and I2. We don't have to do this explicitly uh, in terms of the numbers that we have. In fact, it's a little bit easier if we just do it algebraically. So go ahead and uh, take some time to work on this one. And then uh, I'll come around and uh, talk to you guys about it. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and talk about this one. So what we want to do here is we want to find expressions for the magnetic field at these three points. Uh, I'm denoting point uh, one, two, and three. Okay, so in order to find the magnetic field at each one of these points, what we need to do is we need to calculate what the magnetic field is due to each one of these wires acting at that point, and then we can just add them together. This is just like superposition principle we use for charges, right? So to find the magnetic field, at point one, what we can do is we can say that the magnetic field from this uh, wire uh, uh, that has the current uh, I1 flowing through it is just going to be, um, so what I want is uh, I want this uh, B uh, at uh, point one. So we're going to first find the, the magnetic field produced by uh, this uh, current I1. This is going to be mu naught. I1 divided by 2 pi times the distance, which is going to be the d. Now, this one is going to point uh, out, right? So this is going to give us some, uh, uh, some uh, direction that's pointing out here, and this is the magnetic field vector. Now, we can do the same thing for this one here, and so this is going to be plus the uh, uh, permeability of free space times uh, I2 divided by 2 pi times times the distance from here to here, which is going to be 3D. And this one also points out, okay? So let's look at what we have for point two. Point two is going to look pretty similar. Uh, this is going to be equal to mu naught I1 divided by 2 pi D. Now I have to be careful about the direction for this one, because when we're looking at the direction for the magnetic field produced by the current I1, this uh, magnetic field is going to go around the wire like this. And so we found that it was pointing out over here, but it's going to be pointing in over here. So it says that this is going to be pointing in. Uh, now when we look at the magnetic field that's produced by this one, it's still this, this distance D here. But this one's going to be pointing out. And so this is going to be mu naught plus mu naught I2 divided by 2 pi D pointing out. Okay. Now, the last one looks kind of similar to the first one. The only difference is the direction that these are going to be pointing and which one has a distance D and which one has a distance 3D. And so we see that when we do this one, this magnetic field B three is going to be equal to mu naught I one divided by two pi three D times the vector pointing out plus mu naught 
I2 divided by 2 pi d, again, with the vector that's pointing out. Okay. Now, if we wanted to calculate this explicitly, uh, the first and third ones are kind of easy because they, they point in the same direction. We could just kind of factor out this unit vector, plug all the numbers in, and then just add them together. The second one's a little bit tricky because the unit vectors are pointing in different directions. We have this one that's pointing in here, and we have the one that's pointing out over here. Yeah? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. That was a mistake. This should be. Uh, yep. I, I did that on purpose to make sure you guys were paying attention. Right? Okay. So this one. This one's pointing in. And like I was saying, this is. If we're going to calculate this, this is easy because these these unit vectors are pointing the same direction. These ones are pointing the same direction. So that means that when I plug the numbers in here, I just add them together. Now the second one's a little bit tricky because these these aren't the same unit vector explicitly, but we know that. In, in is just negative out. So what I could do is I could say, to make these the same, I could make this a negative in. Okay, that just means I'm taking the difference between these two. Okay, and then uh, we could plug in our numbers and, and get our answer that way. Okay, any questions about this one? Okay, so let's move on uh, to the next one. And this actually, I have a, a video uh, demonstrating the. Um, the uh, uh, force of attraction or repulsion between uh, wires when they have currents in the same direction and the opposite direction. This is going to lead into a calculation that we're going to do. So what we're seeing here is the difference between having these currents moving in the same direction or moving in the opposite direction. We're going to uh, calculate and see which, which of these cases is which and uh, why you're experiencing a force that's either attractive or repulsive. So let's uh, move on. Okay, so now here we're considering the case where these two wires are going to be carrying these currents in the same direction. And what we'd like to do, and it's related to the calculations that we did here, what we'd like to do is we'd, we'd like to set up the calculation to show what the force is that uh, uh, current uh, I1 acts on I2. So uh, take a look at this one. It explicitly says the distance between the wires is R. Find an expression for the magnetic force that each wire exerts on the other, assuming they have some length of L. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, take some time to uh, work on this calculation, and we'll uh, go ahead and talk about it afterwards. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this one. So we have these two wires, and they're each carrying a current. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to find what the force is that uh, wire one exerts on wire two uh, due to the magnetic field that's produced by, uh, by wire one. So here's the setup that we have. We have current I1 going up, current I2 going up. These are separated by some distance uh, that I say is R. Okay. So if we want to find the force acting on 2, or more explicitly, we want to find the force that wire 1 acts on wire 2, this says that this is going to be equal to the length of wire 2 times the current that flows through wire 2, which is just I2, across the magnetic field that's produced by wire 1. Okay. So in order to do this, what we need to do first is we can calculate what the, what the magnetic field is that's produced by wire 1 at wire 2. So this says that B1 is going to be equal to mu naught I1 divided by 2 pi times R, where R is just this distance that I have here. Okay. 
Now to find the magnitude of the, of the, the force that uh, is exerted on uh, wire two, all I need to do is I need to take this, I plug it into this equation, and then uh, I can take an absolute value of everything because the, um, the magnetic field and the current are going to be perpendicular to each other. So that, that is the sine of the angle between them is going to be one. So the force that uh, wire one exerts on wire two is going to be equal to uh, L I two U naught I one divided by two pi R. Okay, so that's the magnitude of the force, but we also want to figure out how is this force going to act? Is it going to make this wire move up? Is it going to move left, right, uh, in or out? Uh, we don't really know just from this portion of the calculation, but we can figure out what that direction is going to be by remembering how to apply the right-hand rule to, uh, to these types of equations, right? So remember, when I found this magnetic field, what I did was I said, uh, if the current goes this way, I can apply right-hand rule number two to say, that the magnetic field that current I1 produces next to this wire is going to be pointing in, right? So this is the direction of uh, B1. It's going to go in next to this wire. And if I have this current I2 going up, uh, I can use right-hand rule number one Right, right hand rule, rule number one uh, was the way that we dealt with these cross products. That said, point my fingers to the right, right hand in the direction of the first vector, curl them in the direction of the second vector, and then my thumb is going to point in the direction of the force, or, or the third vector, in this, uh, the force in this case, but uh, in general, the third vector. So, fingers in the direction of I2, curl in the direction of B, thumb is pointing to the left. And so that says that when these two wires, or when these two um, Currents are moving in the same direction. These two wires are going to be attracted towards one another. So we could say, if we wanted to make this some vector, we could say, vector, this is going to be pointing to the left. Left. Okay. Left is very hard to spell. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So, uh, we're going to be moving on to uh, talk about uh, Faraday's law, but before I do that, I want to talk about um, how the magnetic field looks for loops of wire. And so, when, when we have current going around some loop of wire, so we had some circular loop like this that's uh, shown in this, uh, in this slide, but I want to draw it as well because then you can kind of see this uh, animated in some sense. Uh, when you have current going around some loop of wire, like this, so we have current going around like this, this produces a magnetic field, right? We saw that straight wires produce magnetic field, while loops of wire are no different. Right? The only difference is really is the geometry that, that we have here. And it turns out that when we have this uh, loop of wire like this, this is going to produce some magnetic field that's going to go like this. Right? Now, what we can do is we can, we can think about how this compares to a bar magnet. So uh, the activity here is to draw the magnetic field lines for a bar magnet, and then consider how they, they look compared to uh, this uh, loop of wire. So remember what we had north end, south end of a bar magnet. So go ahead and uh, draw what that looks like, and then uh, think about how that compares to this. OK, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to talk about that. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and talk about this one. So um, I have this loop of wire drawn like this. Um, and we could see, um, I mean, it, it, would, it would be a little bit difficult to, for us to calculate this explicitly, but you could calculate what the magnetic field is um, from this loop of wire uh, here. Um, but what we, what we really want to do here is we want to uh, compare this to the way the bar magnet looks. And so if I look at the bar magnet, here's my my north end, and here's my south end. The magnetic field lines are going to come towards the south 
and they're going to go away from the north. And so when I look at these two things, they look almost exactly the same in terms of the geometry of the, the uh, magnetic field lines. And so what that tells us is if I have current going around some loop of a wire like this, I can think about it as if this, this loop is really just a, a bar magnet. And we have a little bit more intuition about the way that bar magnets behave. So if I, if I see some loop of wire like this and I can figure out what the direction of the magnetic field is, I can just, in my mind, replace it with a bar magnet. And the way that this loop is going to behave is exactly the same way as the way that the, uh, the bar magnet would behave if I put some other magnetic field uh, near it. OK, so uh, moving along, uh, this is a, a question pertaining to uh, the magnetic flux. And this was something that I had, had talked about before. And this is going to be leading into uh, Faraday's law. And so this says, uh, magnetic flux is defined to be the product of the magnetic field. And the area, this tells you uh, the number of magnetic field lines uh, present for a given area. Uh, find the units of uh, magnetic flux if you know um, that uh, the magnetic flux phi sub b is going to be equal to the product of the magnetic field and the area. And here, um, I, I described this a little bit earlier, theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector. Um, that's the vector that's perpendicular to uh, the, the loop of wire, or uh, uh, it's, uh, it's normal to the plane that the, uh, the loop of wire is in. Okay, so go ahead and uh, talk about this and, and figure out what the units of magnetic flux are, and then we'll go ahead and talk about it. So this one, this one is pretty quick, so we can, we can talk about this. So we introduced this concept called uh, magnetic flux. And the way that I define magnetic flux was to say that the magnetic flux is going to be the product of the magnitudes of the magnetic field and the area that the magnetic field passes through and the cosine of the angle between those two things. So we were interested here in finding what the units of the magnetic flux are. And so in order to do that, we just take the product of the units of magnetic field and the product uh, and, and uh, the units of area. So the units of magnetic field, we remember, are going to be Tesla. Area has units of meters squared. The cosine cosine of theta, if we look at the units, uh, this doesn't have any units. We say this is like units of unity. It's units of one or nothing. Um, so when we... When we take the product of these two things, we end up seeing that the units of the magnetic flux are just going to be uh, Tesla times meters squared. OK? And that's it. All right. So now that we are familiar with the notion of magnetic flux and, and the way that it's uh, defined dimensionally, what we'd like to do is we would like to do some calculations for magnetic flux. So this one says, uh, if you're given a circular loop of wire, with radius of five centimeters oriented in the plane of the page and a magnetic field uh, that has magnitude of uh, 10 Tesla. Calculate the magnetic flux through the loop of wire. If the magnetic field points out of the page, the magnetic field points to the right, and the magnetic field uh, makes an angle of 37 degrees relative to the area vector. That is the vector that points perpendicular to the page. So go ahead and uh, do these three calculations and we'll go ahead and talk about them. Okay, so I want to give you guys a little bit more time uh, with this, but I do want to say something because it seems like a lot of people are having the same confusion. And it has to do with the way that you're defining the area vector and ultimately what the, what the angle is between these. And so for, um, and, and again, remember what it is conceptually that we're trying to do here. So when I, when I kind of introduced the flux at the very beginning of class, what I, what I did was I, I talked about when flux is maximized and when it's minimized. And so imagine we had these lines are representing water flowing. And here's some uh, area that it can flow through. Now, 
this is kind of, in some sense, the area is representing like a pipe. And we want to say, is this going to have a large flux or is it going to have a small flux? If I compare this case to this case. So here's, here's my pipe. I can kind of extend it out like this and then, and then say, okay, now we really have a pipe. And then we can say the same thing here, right? Compare left and right here. Which one of these two cases is going to have more fluid flowing through it? The left side, right? This one very clearly has more fluid flowing through it. And so the way that we're setting the flux up here, say this is, here's my area A. Here is my magnetic field B. These both have vectors associated with it so that when I take this dot product, this is really A dot B, or well, do I want to make it that complicated? Um, this, is, this is the way that you, you really want to define it because you're, you're doing a little bit of uh, vector algebra here. So I've I got to walk it back because I can't use calculus. Um, so. The way the way that these are these are defined, they're both vectors, right? And you want to say in in some case these vectors are going to be in the same direction, in some case these vectors are going to be perpendicular to each other. But the thing that the thing that that is really at the, at the heart of uh, what it is that we're doing here is defining what the direction is that's perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, this direction that's perpendicular to the surface is the same direction as the magnetic field, right? In this case, the, the direction that uh, is perpendicular to the surface is itself perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so in this case here, these are in the same direction. That makes the cosine of, of the angle equal to 1. In this case, they're perpendicular, so it's a cosine of 90, which is zero. And so you can see how that ends up maximizing the, um, the dot product, or, or it maximizes the flux in this case, and it minimizes the flux in this case because of the way that we're defining this area vector. So the punchline here is when we're looking at this and we're trying to define what the cosine of the angle is between A and B, we have to think that A here is pointing perpendicular to the plane that the area is in. And so that's to say that uh, here, this area is really, we could say that the area is pointing out. That's, that's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the, the direction that the area points in some sense. That's the, the, the vector that's perpendicular to the surface of the, of the um, uh, of the plane that the area resides in. And the, the other way that we can see this, and I, I, I mentioned this to somebody, seldom is it, is it instructive or more instructive to look at these things in uh, three dimensions. But uh, if we wanted to define what our area vector looks like for a cube, each side has its own area vector associated with it. And the area vector associated with each face is just perpendicular to the face. Right? So for the top, it's pointing up. For this side, it's pointing to the right. For this side, it points out like this. Right? So you think about this for like a cube in, in three dimensions, but it's really exactly the same thing for some flat area in two dimensions. The area vector is just going to be pointing perpendicular to that, that surface. Okay. So go ahead and use that and think a little bit more about this. And you'll see that one of these is going to be maximized for the flux. One of them is going to be minimized. And then uh, a third is going to be somewhere in between. Okay. So take a, a little bit more time to, to talk about that now that I've uh, described this a little bit more. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this. So really what this is, what this is getting, getting you to think about has to do with uh, the way that we're defining whether uh, a field is going to be going through an area or not. And that's actually really important. And we, we were talking about it in the context of like water flowing, right? We, if we're building some, um, some kind of, um, I don't know, like a sewage treatment plant or some water uh, pipes or something, we need to know whether water is going to be flowing in the same direction or, or perpendicular to the, to the pipe that we have. And when we're talking about magnetic fields, it's kind of the same thing. We need to know, is a magnetic field going to go in the same direction as the orientation of a loop? Is it going to be perpendicular? Is it some kind of combination between them? Uh, 
So what this problem is, is really setting up is, is trying to think about the directions that these area vectors and the directions of these magnetic fields are going to be pointing and whether in the same or um, different directions. So in order to do this calculation, we had three, three portions. We had uh, A, we had B, and we had C. And really, it all comes down to the cosine of the angle here. So I'm not going to explicitly do the calculation. Um, we all know how to use calculators at this point. But the important thing to take away from this is that for the first one, the cosine of the angle between these, cosine of theta, is going to be equal to 1 because we have uh, a theta is equal to 0. Okay? Um, because A points this way, B points this way, and so if these are in the same direction, the cosine of the angle between them is uh, just going to be 1 because th there's, there's no difference in the angle. They point the same, same way. Okay. Then we can look at the second one. For the second one, I said the magnetic field points to the left. Well, the area is still going to be pointing in the same direction. The area still points this way. Now, if magnetic field points this way, we say that these two things are perpendicular to each other. So we would say that cosine of theta is going to be equal to 0 because theta is going to be equal to 90 degrees. Okay. Now, the last one is going to be somewhere in between uh, these two. And so I explicitly gave you what the angle was here. And so this is just going to be cosine of 37. Uh, which is actually going to be equal to four fifths. So, interesting note here for those of you that uh, that w are planning on taking MCATs or other standardized tests. This is a co 37 seems like a really random number to take uh, a cosine of, uh, but it happens to be uh, a very specific angle for a very specific triangle. And so this is a little bit of an aside, but it'll be useful for you if you end up taking one of these exams because these angles end up coming up very often. So. This is for what's called a Pythagorean triplet. And this is, uh, in general, uh, the Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. But there are some very special a's, b's, and c's that you can have here where they're all whole numbers. And this cosine of 37 happens to be for the one where, um, if this is 37, this is 53 degrees, this is a uh, 3, 4, 5 triangle. So this is 3, 4, and 5. So, as I said, th these are useful things to know if you plan on taking these standardized tests because you can save some time with these questions. They write them in a very particular way so that if you know this, you can spend less time on a question because then you just know, okay, cosine of 37 is 4 fifths uh, rather than taking the time to plug this in your calculator to find it. Okay, so this is a useful piece of information uh, and uh, kind of a bonus thing for, uh, for today's class. Okay. So now that we're, uh, we're talking about magnetic flux, it's also important to talk about what the magnetic field is that's produced by a, uh, what's called a solenoid. So a solenoid is uh, kind of like a stack of loops of wire. So you have like a whole bunch of loops of wire that have current going around them. Uh, this is just the equation for um, the uh, magnetic field uh, produced by a solenoid. So we had an equation for the magnetic field produced by a long straight wire. We also have the equation uh, for uh, the magnetic field produced by a solenoid. Uh, I'm not going to do a lot with this in class, but there might be something on the homework with this equation, so that's why I bring it up. Okay, so now we're getting into Faraday's law and Lenz's law. So this comes to what I was talking about before uh, when we were saying that nature abhors changes in flux and acts in a, in a way to oppose it. And so what we're going to see with this series of questions, there's a whole bunch of them that are very similar to each other. Um, what we're going to see is that there's going to be some magnetic field that passes through this area. And what we want to do is we want to think about if this magnetic field is going to be increasing or decreasing, is that going to increase or decrease the flux? How is the flux going to change if I'm changing the magnetic field? And how is this loop going to have to produce a current or produce a magnetic field to oppose this change? So for this first question, and like, like I said, you'll get a hang of the, uh, the questions that I'm asking here because they're all very similar. But for the first question, ask yourself, if this magnetic field is constant, is the magnetic flux going to be increasing, decreasing, or is it going to stay the same? So go ahead and, and, and talk about this one briefly, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, the next one. Thank you. 
Okay, so let's let's talk about this one. And this is, it's not really a, a trick question, but it, it is very straightforward for this one. You'll see why it's why this one is, and some of the other other ones are not. So when we're looking at this magnetic field, if it's constant magnetic field going through this loop of wire, then uh, there's not going to be any change in the flux, right? It's just always going to be the same. So. This says that uh, the magnetic flux is going to remain the same. Now, we want to ask ourselves, what is the, uh, what is the uh, induced magnetic field going to do? So when we have situations of changing magnetic flux, we end up having some uh, magnetic field that the loop is going to produce in order to oppose the change. And so in this case, what is the induced magnetic field going to have to do, or is there going to be an induced magnetic field in order to oppose the change in the flux? So go ahead and, and talk about this one. What does it mean by induced magnetic field? So this is, again, this kind of comes back to the, the idea of uh, Lenz's law and, and the fact that if there's a change in the magnetic flux, the loop is going to do something to oppose the change. So here... Right, right. So this one doesn't have a change. So that means that there shouldn't be an induced magnetic field. But what we're, what we're going to see with some of the later questions is that I'm going to say that magnetic field is going to be increasing. How does, how does the loop have to behave, or how does the magnetic field that the, the loop creates have to behave in order to oppose that change? And that's, that's really kind of the game we're playing. These are kind of the trivial examples because nothing's really happening here. So this one is no. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> I guess I just won't cut that. Okay, so looking at this one, we saw that on the last one, there, there was no change in the magnetic flux. If there's no change in the magnetic flux, there's not going to be any induced magnetic field. And so here, the answer should be E, because there's no induced magnetic field. Now, the last part of this, and like I said, these are in, in a, a sequence of, of questions that uh, there, there are three parts to, uh, to each question for each scenario that I, that I lay out here. In order to have some magnetic field, we saw that uh, there had to be some current to produce the magnetic field. And so, in this case, again, this, this example is a little bit trivial, but um, we saw that there was no change in the magnetic magnetic flux, that meant that there was no induced magnetic field, and so what current creates no magnetic field is kind of the question that's, that's asked here. So go ahead and, and talk about that one and then we'll, we'll reconvene. All right, so let's talk about this one and we'll move on to some more, more interesting examples of, uh, of how these things are going to behave and we'll, we'll see um, uh, throughout the rest of the class today and uh, next class uh, uh, a whole, pretty much all of the, all the permutations of how these, uh, these things can behave. So in this case, uh, because there's no magnetic field that this loop produces, there's no current going around the loop in order to produce that magnetic field. So let's look at some non trivial cases and say, okay, well now consider the loop of wire has an increasing magnetic field going through it, where this magnetic field is going to be pointing out. Is this magnetic flux going to be increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? So go ahead and uh, talk about this one and answer. Okay, so Again, we're kind of moving into more non-trivial questions. And this one, the first one's a little bit easier than the next two. But in this case, we said that the magnetic field is going to be increasing. And so if the magnetic field is going to be increasing, that means the magnetic flux is in turn going to be increasing. Okay. So now that we know that the magnetic flux is going to be increasing, we want to think about what is the direction that the induced magnetic field, or what is the direction of the magnetic field the loop is going to create in order to oppose that change. So we know that we're increasing the magnetic flux, uh, and we, we know that, that that's from the magnetic field increasing, pointing out. So how is the induced magnetic field going to have to point in order to oppose that change? So go ahead and talk about that one. 
Okay, so let's talk about this one. So based on, on the information given here, we know that the magnetic field pointing out is increasing. And the magnetic field that is induced due to the loop needs to oppose that change. And so I'm getting more and more magnetic field pointing out. So that tells us that the induced magnetic field needs to point in. So we know that the induced magnetic field is going to point in. We want to think about what is the direction the current needs to go in order to produce that magnetic field. This kind of comes along the lines of the way that we were using right-hand rule number two. And I also laid out in, in the video, this was a little while ago, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it after I let you guys think about this. There's, there's a third version of the right-hand rule that, that allows us to figure out what the direction of the, of the current is here uh, really quickly. Okay, so go ahead and uh, talk about this one, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about it together. All right, so let's, let's talk about this one. And, and as, as you kind of see the, the patterns arising, we're gonna do these uh, quicker as we go. So we know that the induced magnetic field needs to be pointing in. And so in order to get a current that, go, that produces that magnetic field, there's kind of a couple of ways that we can, we can look at this. And this is gonna lead into the third right-hand rule uh, that I laid out in the video. So we know that for this loop, we know that the induced magnetic field, and the way that I, I denote this is uh, B uh, with a, uh, a subscript, uh, I and D. So the induced magnetic field is going to be pointing in. Uh, so how could we get a, a current to go around this loop in order to produce that? Well, there's, there's really two choices. We could have it going clockwise or we could have it going counterclockwise. And the rule that we were using before, right hand rule number two, said that if I have some current going around or, or some current going through a wire, the magnetic field is going to go uh, around this wire like this. So I could make a choice, I could go this way and see, does this give me a uh, magnetic field that points in. Well, if I point my thumb in the direction of the current and curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, that tells me that everywhere I'm going to have some magnetic field that's pointing out. Okay? So it can't be counterclockwise. Now let's see what happens if I do go clockwise. If I go clockwise, this is going to have the magnetic field going in. So that, that is what we want. And that, that's how we can come to that conclusion using right hand rule number two. But right hand rule number three says, if I want to find what the direction of the current is that goes around some loop of wire, what I do is I take my thumb and I point it in the direction of the magnetic field. So point my thumb in the direction of the induced magnetic field and then my fingers are going to curl around in the direction of the current. And so this says induced magnetic field goes in, thumb in the direction of induced magnetic field, curl in the direction of the current. And so that says that for this one, this is going to go around in the clockwise direction. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. And like I said, you, we're gonna see a lot of patterns arising as we're, as we're going through these. So now, this one says, uh, you still have the magnetic field that's pointing out, but it's gonna be decreasing. So is the flux going to be increasing or decreasing? Real quick on this one. And we can, we can kind of just answer this together. So is this going to have an increasing or decreasing magnetic flux? Decreasing, okay? So if that magnetic flux is going to be decreasing, so go ahead and, and, and put your answers in for that. I'll give you another uh, uh, 10 seconds or so. So if that magnetic flux is going to be decreasing, what is the direction of the induced magnetic field in order to oppose that change? So how are we going to oppose that change if it's decreasing? Go ahead, I'll give you a little bit more time to talk about this one. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this one. So we saw for the previous question, we had increasing magnetic flux, uh, and the magnetic field that was increasing was pointing out. And in order to oppose that change, the induced magnetic field had to point in. But in this question, what we're saying is we have some magnetic field that's pointing out to start with, but it's decreasing. So how are we going to oppose the change in that case? 
How are we going to oppose the change in that case? What do you guys think? Yeah. By having the induced field point out as well. By having the induced field point out as well. Exactly. Okay. So the next question is then, how are we going to have the current go in order to produce that induced magnetic field? Go ahead and talk about that one. Okay, so for this one we saw that the induced magnetic field is going to be pointing out, it's going to be pointing towards us. So in order to produce that magnetic field, what we say is induced magnetic field goes this way, we can apply right hand rule number three, thumb in the direction of the induced magnetic field, fingers curl in the direction of the current that says that the current is going to go around in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. All right, so let's look at another one. Now, we're going to flip the case here. And instead of having the magnetic field pointing out, we're gonna have the magnetic field pointing in, and this magnetic field is going to be increasing. So is the flux, in the case of this magnetic field that's increasing, is the flux gonna be increasing or decreasing? Let me just answer it together. Is this gonna be increasing or decreasing? Increasing, okay. So go ahead and lock those, those answers in real quick. Now, how is the induced magnetic field going to point to oppose that increase? So we want to oppose the increase in magnetic flux in this case. So think about it and, and, and talk about what is the direction that the induced magnetic field needs to point to oppose this change. Okay, so here we said that this magnetic field pointing in is going to be increasing. To oppose this change, how should the induced magnetic field point? It should point out, okay? So then, next question, and we're, we're probably getting a hang of these now. Now, what is the direction the current needs to point in order to produce an induced magnetic field that's going to be pointing out? So, real quick, talk, talk about this one and then we'll, we'll answer. Okay. It's so already, I hear, hear people saying the answer already, so I think we're, we're getting the hang of these. So, in this, in this case, our induced magnetic field is going to be pointing uh, out. And so, in order to have that induced magnetic field point out, the current is going to have to go around in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. Got a couple more of these ones like this, and then I have some that are a little bit different. So, now we have our magnetic field pointing in, it's decreasing. Is this going to be an increasing or decreasing flux? Again, we can, we can answer this really quickly together. This should be a decreasing flux if the magnetic field is going to be decreasing. So go ahead and, and put those answers in real quick. And we're going to ask ourselves, what is the direction of the induced magnetic field uh, if we're having a decreasing magnetic field pointing in? Okay, so here's the next question. What is the direction of the induced magnetic field if this uh, original magnetic field is going to be decreasing? Okay. Okay, so this one has a decreasing magnetic field pointing in. So our induced magnetic field needs to oppose that change, and so we're losing magnetic field going in. So we need magnetic field going in to oppose that loss. So then, this is going to be the last one of, of this form. Uh, what should the direction of the induced current be in order to oppose that change? Okay, so go ahead and uh, talk about this one. Okay, so I think, I think we, we pretty much have, have these ones down. So in order to produce this uh, induced magnetic field that points in, we're going to need uh, a current that is going to be going in the clockwise direction, right? Okay, so now let's get a little bit more complicated, but it's still the same idea. So now, in this case, I'm telling you, I have just some constant magnetic field here, and I'm moving the loop into the region where the magnetic field is. And so, in this case, we want to ask ourselves, is the uh, magnetic flux going to increase, decrease, or stay the same? 
So go ahead and, and talk about this one. And, uh, this is about as complicated as, as these can get. So go ahead and talk about this, and we'll, we'll talk about it together afterwards. Okay, so in this case, I'm moving this loop from a region where there's no magnetic field to a region where there is magnetic field. And so that's telling me that I'm going to be increasing the magnetic flux. Okay, so let's look at um, what the direction of the induced magnetic field is going to be in order to oppose that change. So I'm increasing the magnetic flux um, from the magnetic field pointing in. What is the direction of the induced magnetic field to oppose that change? Go ahead and talk about that. Okay. Okay. So here, what we see is we're increasing the flux of the magnetic field pointing in. So in order to oppose that, we need an induced magnetic field that is going to be pointing out. Okay. Now the last part of this question is what is the direction the current needs to go in order to produce that magnetic field that's going to be pointing out? Um. All right. So here, and then we're going to have just one more of these, uh, these set of questions after this. But here, in order to produce this induced magnetic field that points out, we're going to need the current to go around in the counterclockwise direction around the slip. Okay. Last one. Okay. So now I'm... Now this, this loop of wire is going to be leaving this region. So now that it's leaving this region, we want to say, is this flux going to be increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? And then we're going to answer the same two questions afterwards for this one. So here, is this flux increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? It's decreasing, right? So if this is going to be decreasing, OK, everybody put their, your answers in. Uh, if this is going to be decreasing, then what is the direction of the induced magnetic field going to be in this case? How do I oppose that decrease? Go ahead and, uh, and talk about that one, and, and then we'll, we'll, uh, I'll give you guys the answer. All right, so for this one, we know that we're, we're losing magnetic fields pointing in. Uh, so we need to oppose that change, so we need magnetic field that's also pointing in. So the induced magnetic field should be pointing in. The last question here is, what is the direction the current needs to go in order to, um, in order to have the uh, magnetic field going in, uh, in order to have this induced magnetic field going in? Okay. Okay. All right, I think we're, we're getting this one. So in order to have this induced magnetic field going in, the current's going to have to go around in the clockwise direction. Okay, so we'll have one more question for today, and this is going to be really kind of applying this knowledge um, uh, now that we've kind of seen how we can break this uh, into pieces into a, a question that um, is uh, going to uh, you know, do all of this at once in some sense. So for this question, um, oh wait, I hadn't gotten there yet. Um, so, okay. So, one way to think about Lenz's law is to think about the direction of the induced magnetic field uh, in order to oppose the change. Another way to think about it is what is the direction of the force acting on this loop. So. This, this loop is going to have some force acting on it that's also going to oppose the change. So think about what the direction the force should be to oppose the change. If I have some velocity moving it out this way, how do I act a force on it to oppose the change in the flux here? So go ahead and, and talk about this one. It's, it's kind of the same thing, but um, we'll see exactly why it's the same thing uh, next class. Okay. So what, what's the direction the force should be in order to oppose the change here? So what, what do you guys think? 
Okay, so for this one, the, the direction of the force should be in such a way to oppose the change in flux. And so as this loop is moving out to the right here, I'm decreasing the flux. And so we want a, a force that's going to oppose that change. And so here what that means is that the force should be pointing to the left to try to maintain the flux that, that we have. Okay. So I lied, there were, there were a couple more before I got to the one I, I thought I was going to get to. Um, so this is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this one next class, but I, I, do, I do want to do this one. So this one, we have both of these loops that are near this, um, this current. Uh, and this current's going to produce a magnetic field. We know that uh, uh, wires that have current in them produce magnetic field. And we're pulling this loop A and this loop B away from this wire. What should the direction of the induced current be in A and in B in order to oppose the change in the flux as we move loops A and B away from this wire. So go ahead and talk about this one. We'll come back to that other question uh, next class. I'll, I'll give you guys some more time on this one uh, next class. Um, but go ahead and you can, you can guess on what the answer to this one is and that'll give you credit for this question. Um, but we'll talk more about this one and the one that we skipped uh, next time. Okay, you guys have a, have a good day and I'll see you on Thursday.